Welcome back to our study in the book of Genesis. We're looking at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2 to 5. The earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. At first, the earth was a shapeless mass. The Bible says, and the earth was out form and void, darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. Some versions say the Spirit was brooding as a mother brood or a bird or her egg. The Spirit is the generator of life. We're told three things about the condition of the original earth. Formless and void. The Hebrew word formless and void are used together two other times in the Old Testament, Isaiah 34 and Jeremiah 4. These are the only times a bohu is used in the Bible. The words seem to form a unity, a bit a unit, a bit like our expression, topsy turvy. <clears throat> Darkness over the face of the surface of the deep, the deep refers to an abyss of water. The same word is used in Exodus 15.5 to describe the Red Sea as it swept over the armies of the pharaohs. It will not be until the third day that we see the dry land appear. The Spirit of God is moving over the face of the waters. The Spirit the word which describes this moving of the Spirit of God is found in Deuteronomy 32.11, where it describes a bird brooding over a young. The picture here is of the Holy Spirit working over the earth and preparing it to bring forth life. What or who was this entity that was hovering over the face of the single great dark ocean? Could it be no less a gentle wind stirring the waters? What part did the Holy Spirit have in the creation of living things? John 1 tells us that Jesus had a part in creation. Is he included in the term Elohim, God or gods, in verse 1? <clears throat> there is only one God, and that is the God who created us. No matter what we hear or read in the newspapers, we did not create God. That means that he is the only God of every man, even if every man does not recognise him as such. The God who created us is a pretty big God. All you have to do is look into the sky to see a glimpse of how big God is. The more powerful telescopes that scientists are able to make, the more galaxies we're able to see. There are millions upon millions, and behind it all is our God. God is personally involved in his creation. We see this especially in the picture of the spirit hovering over the planet Earth as a mother eagle hovers over a young. With all the enormous galaxies and star systems, God is concerned with this little one blue planet and what happens on it. The purpose of the Genesis account is not merely to have us view creation, but that we might see the creator who created the creation. Warfield states it this way, A glass window stands before us. We raise our eyes and we see the glass. We know its quality and observe its defects. We speculate on its composition. Or we look straight through it on the great pros prospect of land and sea and sky beyond. So there are two ways of looking at the world. We may see the world and absorb ourselves in the wonders of nature. That's a scientific way. Or we may look right through the world and see God behind it. That is the religious way. A scientific way of looking at the world is not wrong any more than the glass manufacturer's way of looking at the window. This <clears throat> way of looking at things has its very important uses. Nevertheless, the window is placed there not to be looked at, but to be looked through. And the world has failed its purpose unless it, it too is looking through and the eye rests not on it, but on its God. Genesis is not written for the glassmaker. It was written of me to look through the glass of this account to the creator behind it all. The six days of creation are creative work, are, topic, are topical in nature. This doesn't rule, rule out literal interpretation, but the topical nature should be also be re realised. The outline for this structure can be seen in Genesis 1-2, where the earth was described as being unformed and unfilled. The first three days involved forming the earth, while the second three days involved filling the earth. The Jews delighted in this sort of parallelism. It was like poetry. This observation led some to suggest we are not meant to take the teaching of this chapter with a rigid literalist, but rather as a poetic passage teaching us that God is indeed the creator of all things. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And verse 4, God saw the light was good. God separated the light from darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And it was evening, and it was morning, one day. There is a specific formula that we shall see repeated in each of the six days. The same pattern is followed throughout the chapter. 
God's creative statement. <clears throat> the fiat, let there be. The creative act, there was. A declaration that creation was good. The time limits of that creative period. There was evening and there was morning. The numeric listing of that time, one day. First one, we saw the creative activity of God described outright in the narrative, but are not given any details as to how that work was carried out. It has been described as ex nihilo, creation from nothing. This is actually a misnomer, as it's actually a case of creation from God's power. In verse 3, we see creation via the spoken word of God. We read that God says, and then it comes to pass. Hebrews 11, 3 teaches the same essential truth. The worlds were made by the word of God. By faith, we understand the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. The object of creation on this first day was light. This stands in contrast to the object of the fourth day of creation, which would be the creation of the light bearers. The first describes elemental light, without any reference to the source of that light. The second describes the light sources. <clears throat> At God's word, light came into existence, then God commanded, let there be light. This was the first recorded command of God. We know today that for most things, light is necessary to sustain life. The creation of light, therefore, before life, illustrates the fact that God created all things in a logical order. Let there be light. And there was light. God put his, his power to create in his word when his word. His power to save is also in his word. The New Testament reveals God's word is invested in a person, in Jesus. Light was the result of the first command. Light can represent energy. Notice the very narrow bands of visible light. The creation of light in all its forms, visible and invisible, Actually, the electromagnetic and nuclear energy of the universe may be involved in this order. A spectrum of electromagnetic energy that we see as visible light is a very narrow band compared with a broad spectrum of invisible light energy such as X-rays and radio waves. But visible light is part of the broader spectrum. We know the effect of white light on a leaf of a growing plant, but we don't yet know much about the effects of other forms of radiant energy on living things. We know ultraviolet light, which is invisible to our eyes, has damaging effects on some things, and infrared heats up the surface of solid objects. But we still have a lot to learn about the effects of wide-ranging electromagnetic and nuclear radi radiation on living things. Light, or the stored energy of light in the form of organic compounds, such as those that spew from the fumaroles at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Atlantic Ocean, are usually necessary for life to exist. If there had never been light, life could never have been. As the Bible says, blood is the life of the flesh. Light is necessary for most, li for most living things. <clears throat> the only way darkness can exist in the presence of light is if a solid body comes between light and the observer. That can be day and night at the same time because the source of light is on the opposite sides of a solid object to block the light. When God calls the light day and the darkness night, this possibly implies the setting in motion of the earth's rotation. God saw that light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. Light can also represent goodness and truth. This was just a fast of the great separations. The concept of separation is an important one in the spiritual realm, just as it is in the physical. The darkness can exist in the presence of light implies shadow. What was this light if its source was not the sun? Because that is what he has done, it's he who has rescued us from the ruling force of darkness and who transfers us into the kingdom of the sun that he loves. Genesis 1 verse 5 called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening and morning, the first day. This is the first of several meanings of the word day. God named these things over which only he has control. The Jews began the 24th day at sundown. Did God set the beginning of the first day in the evening because darkness came before light in creation? When used a day, they meant the beginning of and ending points of two parts of a day as used in that sense. There's always darkness on one side of the earth. When our side of the earth is in darkness, it is night for us. Something that before man was created to measure time in human terms, God used the term day one, day two to indicate steps in the creative process. 
He could have created everything in one day if he wanted. I think the reason he attributes the acts of certain days and makes six of them is to establish the basis for man's work week. <clears throat> day and night. We know that in a rotating earth with 230 tilts from the perpendicular, day and night are different periods of length at different distances from the equator at different times of the year. North of the Arctic Circle and south of the Antarctic Circle, the length of what may be called day and night have lengths of six months each. <clears throat> the great creative power of God, the power that brought the physical universe into existence, was his word. Does God's word have the same power today? Discuss the concept that God's word was and still is a person. God's power to save is now in his gospel. The second day, God said, let there be expanse in the midst of the waters, let it separate the waters from the waters, and God made the expanse and separated the waters, which were below the expanse from the waters, which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and it was evening, and it was morning, a second day. <clears throat> the old King James Version translates the word, Hebrew word, with the English word firmament. The new American Standard Version replaces it with the word expanse. This word is 17 times in the Old Testament. Most of these instances take place in the first chapter of Genesis. Before looking at the other instances, let us first look at all of its use in this chapter. <clears throat> Rekha is defined in verse 8. God called it heaven. Note the Hebrew plural, heavens. This seems to be further explained in verse 20. Let the birds fly above the earth in the open, open expanse of the heavens. It literally means upon the face of the Rakai of the heavens. The summary is given in the following observation. It took place in the midst of the waters in verse 6. It separates the upper waters from the lower waters in verse 7. It was called heaven in verse 8. It had lights, the sun and the moon in verse 17. It was a place where the birds flew in verse 20. Any attempt to assign a specific meaning, such as atmosphere or outer space, is doomed to frustration when we consider all of its observations. The problem is that we're inclined to try to read in a 21st century interpretation into an ancient Semitic text. But to understand it will not be difficult if we put ourselves into the shoes or sandals of the early Hebrew writer. He's not attempting to describe precise scientific phenomena, rather he's describing the world from his own vantage point. Have you ever gone out at night and looked into the sky? What do you see? Could you tell by looking where the atmosphere and the clouds end? And where outer space begin? No. All you could see was the distinction between down here and up there. That's how the Hebrews describe things. I'm not saying that they were in a scientific error any more than we are in scientific error when we speak of the sun rising and setting. <clears throat> Psalm 19 and 150 give us a little help in further determining the nature of this firmament. The heavens are telling the glory of God, their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Ezekiel also mentions this word in his first chapter. As there the prophet describes a vision of the throne of God. It looks like this. The throne of God, the Raka, and the four living beings. In spite of the vividness of this description, the Raka itself is not described. It's merely understood without explanation. Up to this point, there's not a lot of help found in the actual uses of the word within the Old Testament. However, when we look at the root word, there is a possible clue. The root is rakwai, only the yoda is missing. It seems that this word can carry a double meaning. On one hand, it can refer to that which is spread out. On the other hand, it is used to describe the act of stamping the foot, or even stamping on the enemies of the Lord. When used in the intensive stems, it takes on the idea of beating out precious metals, spreading them out over a wide area. Thus we are left with a picture of God as the Creator, spreading out the expanse of heaven, carefully placing each of the heavenly bodies in the dome of the sky, all designed to be seen from the earth below and to bear witness of His majesty and might. When you go out at night and look at the velvet dome of the sky above, consider the hosts of heaven, and remember there was God who set it all in this place. I hope you've got something out of this lesson. Feel free to come back and be with us once more. Every blessing.